Okay, so let's get started. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's literary Zoom lecture brought to you by Wilton Library. I'm Michael Bellicosa, Community Engagement Manager here at the library, and I'm very pleased to be introducing this lecture, which is made possible with the support of the literary series in memory of Amy Quigley. Uh, this is the fifth of five, so we'll be wrapping up tonight, although Mark will mention something about the next series that we have in the works. Uh, because we have a large audience, we're going to use the Q&A function in Zoom, where you can send me questions or comments, which I'll relay to Mark. And of course, Mark is always happy to answer questions that you email him directly. And uh, we're going to do what we've done the last, uh, the last weeks in this series, which is after Mark gives us some introductory comments, uh, he's, uh, he's going to want to get some immediate reactions or impressions from you all before he then continues. So feel free to, uh, to start putting into the Q&A um, any of your immediate reactions or impressions of the book, and then I will now turn this over to Mark. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, let me explain to everyone, welcome. Uh, thanks to Michael and the library <clears throat> and to all of you for participating. Let me say that um, I have a two monitor system on my desk right now temporarily. This one where I'm looking at the camera and this one where I'm not, which is a better monitor. So if I look up, I'm not being distracted. I'm just looking at a better view of nothing in particular. In any event, um, tonight we close with The Sound and the Fury. I think it's fair to say um, one of the greatest American novels ever written in the view of literary historians. I have great respect for it um, and a, a good way to end the series. Look at how far we've come from um, uh, the House of Mirth and that kind of um, 19th century um, conventional, well-written, but still conventional kind of narrated novel. Um, <clears throat> obviously, if you've never read The Sound and the Fury before, and that might be true of some of you, um, you may be daunted by thinking, uh, how can you possibly do justice in a single reading? Well, well, you can't, but it's not nothing. And I will say, especially if any of you are new to this series, remember, I'm trying each time to give a kind of topographical overview. So I don't intend to um, make sense of uh, everything that happens in the novel. I think, in fact, Faulkner would want, not want us to read it that way. And even when people in an academic environment, graduate students and undergraduates that I've taught in my classes, I discourage them from trying to get, this was well before the internet, copies of chronologies and figuring out who's who. Uh, part of the message of the book is that it is fractured. Uh, it is not just collage-like, uh, it is disintegrated. And unlike uh, something like um, in our time where there's a kind of wholeness suggested by the fragments and certainly a wholeness in the therapeutic ending with Nick Adams, um, this is a novel where the interior monologues of the three brothers, there are four siblings and four sections you would think that everyone would get one and you'd think the last one would go to Caddy. It doesn't for reasons I'll explain. But it means that the first three sections, those interior monologues, people talking to themselves, is emblematic of the fact that this is a family that does not communicate. One narrator is cognitively impaired and has been castrated, uh, is forlorn much of the time, can't bear to look at himself in a mirror naked. Another brother uh, is mentally ill and suffused with an odd kind of guilt where he wants both to protect his sister's virginity and likely is obsessively involved with her sexuality. And a third brother who's distorted uh, by anger uh, and hatred, um, a kind of a typical um, uh, sort of um, um, dissatisfied white person in the South who doesn't have appreciation for much of anything. Um, and so the, the fracturing of a novel is meant to challenge us to say, look what has happened 
to this family. The fact that three of those four sections, the fourth one being omniscient narrator, more or less in chronological order, and gives us a breath of fresh air with Dilsey and her family, that that takes place on Easter Sunday, and two of the others take place on Good Friday. Jason's in a kind of self-crucified hell. Uh, and on uh, Benji's birthday, Holy Saturday, play with time. So in addition to it having the marker of being interested in collage or fragmentation, uh, in the idea that time is now considered as a new subject for the novel and also a way of uh, con changing the way you convey reality in a novel. So Ulysses published uh, seven years before this book, uh, all takes place in one day. And many modernist novels in England, some of which we talked about, play with time uh, in a way that um, suggests that some of the basic things we take for granted uh, are not stable. So in Benji's section, there is no time in his experience. He lives in an eternal present. Um, he is impaired. Uh, and so he doesn't do it by choice, but his world is entirely impressionistic. There are about a hundred cuts between one image and another. Uh, you can't keep track of all of them. You're not meant to keep track of all of them. Um, Quentin's book, uh, by contrast, this section, he's obsessed by time. Uh, he feels that Christ was worn away by a minute clicking of little wheels, and he's going to step out of time uh, by drowning himself, although that scene is not depicted at the end of his section, only his preparations for it. <clears throat> and then the third section on Good Friday, which, as I said, uh, Jason, he being sort of self-crucified, beaten and almost killed, very impaired, kind of degraded. He has to accept a ride from a Black person to get home. In his book, I think time, as with all else with him, is money. He just thinks in terms of money. Not family, he has no wife, he has no child. He has um, a, a prostitute that he pays, there's the money again. He's obsessed with the money that he's stolen and the little money that he's earned. He is a classical non-worker, um, a kind of anti-hero to the maximum degree. And then Easter Sunday, the book that's dominated by Dilsey, we come into the fresh air of normal narration, a kind of wholeness, where time is eternal for Dilsey. Um, in some ways, it doesn't exist for her, but radically different from the way it doesn't exist for Benji. So I'm going to stop for a moment, as I have in the last few weeks, and ask Michael if he wants to pass on to me answers to the very basic question of how you found the book. And I welcome either people who are encountering it for the first time, and especially people who've come back to it. I say especially those people, because I imagine a lot of first time readers response would be, uh, I was confused as hell, but I could be wrong. So Michael, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Mark. So, um... Let's see. We've got one person, I think unsurprisingly, commenting that they found it, the very early sections very difficult to follow. Um, I think that's understandable. I was going to throw in my own my own impression to give people some time to type things in the box there. Have that I read this for the first time between last Friday and and uh, a couple of days ago, and the first time through the first section. I, you know, I had some vague sense of what was going on, but really kind of didn't really know what was going on with it. And then I waited and I waited. And at the end of that day, I reread the first section, not having read any more of the of the rest of the book. And I started kind of understanding it a little bit more. Um, but and I asked you this question in the before we started, Mark, even though I then read the rest of the book and I understood a lot more of what was going on in it. Um, I really didn't understand some pretty important parts of it until I read what I eventually found that appendix. And that was my question to you earlier was it like, how is it, is it almost literally absolutely essential to read the appendix in order to figure this book out? 
Yeah, and again, I want to say, and, and I feel this very strongly, uh, many, many works of literature, whether they're um, modernist or postmodern or so old that we have trouble with the culture of Homer or the language and rhetoric of Shakespeare, uh, might be hard to figure out using Michael's phrase, and I'm not mocking him for it. A lot of people think of how can I solve the mystery of this work of art? And I want to urge you not to think of a poem or a play or a short work of fiction or a novel as something you have to figure out. I want to urge you instead to think of it as something to experience. And if in reading this book, you are put off by <clears throat> the sound and the fury of its participants, the lack of connection, the lack of nurturing from Mr. and Mrs. Thompson, one of whom uh, favors her son Jason only uh, and is um, abnormally interested in her uh, aristocratic past as she imagines it, and uh, a cynical drunkard in the father, and so much of the affection um, is left to uh, Caddy to show to some of her brothers as a kind of um, surrogate mother. If, if that's your experience, then you're getting the novel. And if you're not exactly sure what it is that happens in this place or that place, I don't say this to be patronizing. I'm telling you exactly the same thing I have told my students at Yale and Columbia and Trinity College and NYU. Don't worry about that. Why would a man write a novel in which an impaired 33-year-old man boy is infatuated with his lost sister, uh, infatuated in the sense of foolishly connected to her. I don't mean there's anything sexual in his love for Caddy, but it's certainly physical. She used to sleep with him. Uh, why would such a man put that boy man next to a field where the name Caddy, C-A-D-D-I-E, is called out constantly? Why would he put two Quentins, one male and one female, in the same book? Why would he give you any number of Jasons? Why would he not uh, put some kind of spacing or marker to help you find your way through? Because he doesn't want you to find your way through. He wants you to experience the sound and the fury of the book. Uh, and again, this is the same thing I tell my students who perhaps even more than you fetishize their worry uh, that they're uh, missing something. And if they don't get the, the notes or the guidelines, uh, they'll be out of luck. So I'm gonna ask you to hold on a moment. Okay, here it goes. Can uh, you still see me, Michael? I can, I can see you and hear you. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my notes and tell you some things uh, I wrote down because I think they're smart. Let's see if I'm right. Um, so again, not so much a reintegration of parts as a collage, but rather more of a disintegration. And we have to ask ourselves, why does this book not hope for the kind of integration that you have in Winesburg, Ohio, where despite the separation of parts, uh, George Willard actually goes out of town, gets out of town uh, and writes the book uh, that we are reading, uh, as it were, as Sherwin Anderson. Uh, why is there a kind of epiphany at the end of this side of paradise? Uh, why is there certainly a kind of integration, wholeness and tragic recognition uh, at the end of the House of Mirth. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the ending of um, uh, In Our Time. Uh, why isn't it in this book? And the answer is slavery and the Old South. Faulkner, uh, Mississippian, 19 novels. This is the fourth of them, his favorite. Fascinated with how the sins of the father are visited upon the children. Almost every one of his novels have the multiple themes of the fall of the Old South, the bitterness or self-deception of the white people who are surviving, uh, the wound of um, losing the Civil War uh, and a way of life that is now gone with the wind, the complicated race relations in this novel, the Blacks who were slaves in some past, at least some of them, uh, are now servants. 
And we know in many families that wasn't so far removed from the old relationship. But uh, why is this novel filled with gaps and lacuna and missing parts? Uh, why does Caddy not get her own section to narrate? Uh, and I'm going to answer that question. Well, Mark, Caddy, um, yeah, look, I was going to say that we've got we've got eight or nine pretty pretty solid comments here. Do you want to just uh, react to them one by one? Uh, well, why don't I react to a couple, okay. uh, but not overdo that? Well, with all respect to my commenters, since I have other things to say, but yeah, let me let's take a couple. Okay. Um, when I first read the book, I thought Dilsey had the final say, but this time I feel it may be Mr. Compson, whose idea of life is captured in the title. So I wonder if this is Faulkner's version of the wasteland. There isn't really any salvation available to modern people. Well, I think it's hard not to see the end of the novel in the appendix. And I don't know if the commenter read the appendix. My edition had it from when I first read the novel. The last two words of the appendix are they endured in reference to the Black family, the Dilsey's family. Um, I do think there is much of the wasteland in uh, the way the South is depicted. I talked in my Victorian series about the domesticated Gothic the genre of some of these novels by Faulkner has come to be called Southern Gothic, much to the chagrin of many contemporary living now Southerners, uh, that there's a kind of hauntedness or monstrosity in the South, inbreeding, incest, anger, fury, racism, hatred, all born of a distorted system of owning other people. Um, I do think there's some hint that Dilsey's family and their enduring being a real family, her daughter takes her in, they move to Memphis, is a counterbalance to that, but not one that overrides the darkness of the regular plot. This will not be a musical anytime soon. Uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda is not going to touch this book. Yeah. Go ahead, Michael, give me another. Okay, well, actually connected to a musical uh, image. Person says, the choice of four parts intrigued me as if in a sonata or a symphony. Is this a symphony of disintegration? Well, it's certainly an apt phrase, I, I wanna say. I think lots of things have four parts, four, four, four sections or parts are, are not just limited uh, to music. Uh, we have four compass par points and it's a kind of uh, four square. It's a kind of image of completeness. But what's most interesting is that there's a part missing, uh, which is uh, Katie's, Caddy's part. And I think I'll talk about that now, even though I appreciate uh, that comment. The reason she doesn't get her own section to narrate is because her importance to the novel, and she might be uh, the most important character in the novel, uh, is not how she sees herself or presents herself, but how her brothers see her. She is something of a ghost in the novel, as I have defined and used that word in others of my lectures here in Wilton. Her presence is experienced in the novel and by her siblings as an absence. So what I mean by ghost, and I've taught that idea in many of my lectures and book discussions I teach it in my classes, one of the things that literature can do is make us experience the presence of something that's gone. Sometimes it's more or less a literal or supernatural ghost, but more often than not, it's the kind of thing that when you take a painting down from a wall, the original color of the wallpaper or paint gives you the reminder of what was there before. And even though you don't know what was there before if you just walked into the room. You know it was rectangular, you know it's exact measurements and it's likely it was a mirror or a painting. It's a ghost in that sense. Her presence is experienced as an absence. She's missed by Benji on those occasions when he feels that she's gone as she is. The loss of Kate, Caddy to his uh, um, uh, care is one of the great absences of the book. Um, she is perversely fixed upon by Quentin, who fetishizes her virginity, that is, both the presence 
and the absence of her female sexuality and the several times when either uh, some of the males are looking up uh, at the pear tree as she climbs to look uh, through the window and they see her bloomer bottom or the time her, her uh, panties uh, get muddied uh, in the river and there's a kind of uh, sexual play that's nearly incestuous and they go home and Quentin in particular is afraid he's going to get in trouble with his father who pays no mind to it. Um, there's a kind of ghostliness um, about um, Quentin's, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Caddy's sexuality to her brother. <coughs> and her hatred by Jason keeps her at a distance from the family. And he treats her daughter, Quentin, another ghost, cruelly. That is, Quentin becomes most significant in the novel when she runs away with his money. I've already mentioned the sort of chaos of language, uh, the two caddy words, the multiple Jasons, the two Quentins. My undergraduates complain when we do King Lear, which I teach often, that why did Lear have to make the two brothers Edgar and Edmund? Couldn't one of them be named Bubba or Tony? Couldn't he give us a break? I give them a mnemonic, which tends to work, but they, uh, they, they, uh, raise their hackles at that. Um, this is something I think that Faulkner is doing quite intentionally to make the model muddle, <clears throat> the novel muddled, sorry, I have a cold, to convey the muddle of what's left of family and land and language in the wake of the distortion and perversions of slavery. The idea that some of these white landowners think of themselves as aristocrats. How many plantation owners are, are, have the title of colonel? Uh, even if they were never at war, this is true way before the Civil War, never in a regiment, they are some colonel of some state troop or guard, uh, and they wear that title as a badge of honor. By contrast to Quentin and Quentin and Jason and Jason and so on, the less conventional names of the black servants in the novel, Dilsey, Roscus, TP, Versch, Frony, Luster, reflect their individualism and genuineness. genuineness. Um, I luxuriate in the imagination that Faulkner has to give those characters names. Um, it's like the naming in the Bible of the animals or when uh, the catalog of ships in the Iliad, there's something exhilarating about that notion that they have distinctive names that are one of a kind in the context of their family. There's no Roscus the second. There's no Roscus three. And I don't think that's a trivial observation. I want to say a little bit more about what I've been saying about gaps or absences more generally. And I say this again, that I've made reference to how part of modernism is our artists and intellectuals turning to the primitive to try to repair the sterility of modern civilization. Faulkner is not looking to do that. This is a civilization that he knows has been rendered sterile by the decades or generation long history of Southern culture in this particular uh, county and place. Again, he caught a lot of grief uh, from people who thought that he was being hyperbolic. Uh, he's not trying to suggest that white, the white South uh, is going to um, get better uh, because he uses references to Jason and the Argonauts or the Old Testament, or the Christian celebration of Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter. It's a much darker novel than that. And part of the darkness is conveyed in these uh, extraordinary gaps. So first and foremost, the family's lost standing uh, and their real or imagined glory of the Bascoms and the Compsons, uh, they are not what they were. Um, remember, a decade later than this, we have Gone with the Wind, where Margaret Mitchell is quite serious that the loss of Southern culture, despite its brutality, uh, slavery, treatment of women, uh, is something to uh, lament. 
there's the loss of the pasture land, which is sold to pay for Quentin's Harvard education, which would be a trade-off even if Quentin got to use his Harvard education, uh, but he kills himself before that comes to any fruition. And the suggestion is he's going to Harvard because his parents want a merit badge. They want <clears throat> his education to reflect something of their social standing. Obviously, another uh, excruciating gap is Benji's manhood. Uh, then there's Jason's money uh, that is stolen from him. He's stolen it also from Caddy and Quentin. There are the deaths of the older generation of family members. Now, many family novels have deaths. Uh, I'm not saying that every time there's a death in a novel about a family, it's a gap. But you get the feeling that there's nothing replacing that, that the family has been atomized uh, and that there's no maternal influence either of Mrs. Compson, who was um, uneven in her affections, or Caddy, who was a pretty good surrogate uh, mother to some of her brothers. Um, and that's another gap. Uh, her leaving the family and the loss of her mothering and sisterly influence. And of course, Miss Quentin is largely experienced as an escapee, as a thief and escapee. So we're now at the bottom of the hour. I'm going to take a break and ask if someone would like to make um, either a comment in the wake of what I've said about how you found the novel or you want to make a comment about anything I've said so far before I go on. Well, I can, I can somewhat combine two, two comments together about the language. Go for uh, it, Michael. Combine. Sorry. I said combine. go for it. Combine away. So the one comment was that I found Faulkner's language in the dialogues in the first section very beautiful. I was able to hear people speak. And then the second comment was that after a couple of other uh, unrelated comments said, I, I find much of Faulkner's often maligned verbiage to function as a sort of drone beneath the music of his poetic prose. Uh, so uh, what was the adjective used on drone? What drone? Uh, he, he, he finds Faulkner's often maligned verbiage to function as a sort of drone beneath the music of his poetic prose. Oh, a poet, uh, so, so drone in a positive sense of a yes. kind of underlying hum. Right, yes. so I, cer I certainly feel that way. Um, and to like Faulkner is to like the kind of ornate uh, rotund language. It's similar to Melville. It's meant to channel a kind of gravity uh, that Faulkner is not satirical about these person, even though there are some comic kind of scenes. And of course, he's capable of writing comedy in others of his novels. But like Melville, there's a gravitas in his treatment of look what's happened to this civilization now well into the 20th century. Um, the this, this Civil War uh, is um, recent history always in the South, certainly by 1929, it's not forgotten. But uh, decades ago, uh, and still they're blighted by this, he, he thinks of that as a deadly serious business and truly does lament it. When he gave his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize, he talked about the role of writers in conveying the dignity of the human spirit. Uh, and that dignity is in what that commenter aptly said is the drone uh, and the poetic underpinnings. Um, it's very stately language um, and not just, um, I know the word verbiage was used, but not just empty verbiage, not just uh, rhetoric for its own sake. It, it has the quality sometimes of a sermon. Um, now, obviously, Benji's section does not. Benji's section is pure impression and jumping around. Quentin's session, section, which also has more than 100 cuts, is someone who is mentally unwell and guilty and beset by time. Jason, again, is distorted by anger. Uh, that's part of the problem of the novel, these wounded or self-inflicted wounded characters. But you see it in the last section, especially in the appendix, there's a good deal of that kind of poetic prose. So I, I agree with that 
reaction. Great. All right, I'm on a roll. I'm going to combine three. Oh my here. goodness. Okay, so these Five are the or a fall, Michael. Be careful. <laughs> these are these are along uh, the idea of character as opposed to language. Uh, the one person said that the first time they read the book, which was uh, some years ago, um, they were, he was interested most in the the style in Faulkner's rendering of the disintegration of post Civil War South, but this time he found himself concentrating on the characters much more, and it was more moving as a result. And then the other person said. When I read this book, I've read this book before, but not for over 25 years, I'd forgotten how unpleasant the people were, except Dilsey, of course. Um, yeah. I remember feeling more sympathetically towards them in Absalom, Absalom, but maybe my memory is faulty. No, I, I, I'm more sympathetic to the characters in Absalom, Absalom, where there actually is a lot of family feeling. Um, I agree with that assessment on not just being automatic. Um, you have to expect that a novel called Sound and Fury <clears throat> is going to be filled with harshness. And when you think about the emotional poverty, the deprivation, the family feeling, the deprivation of family feeling that these children grew up with, and the way that they are, in some cases, parenting themselves, it's a terrible burden to have an impaired brother uh, who is also, they think, a danger when they realize he has sexual feelings. Uh, Quentin is a basket case that no one seems to be paying attention to. And surely any attentive mother or father would have seen the seeds of hatred and anger in Jason well before he got to the age of maturity. Uh, this is a sad case, this family. <clears throat> so I want to talk about the dual ending, and again, if you don't have the edition that has the appendix, which again was my only experience, and if I had thought about it ahead of time, I would have pointed it out to you. If you don't have the appendix and you feel cheated, uh, I would just recommend that you find it online and read through it. I do think it's helpful in um, clarifying something, but it's mainly helpful in what I'm about to tell you, which is why I care about it. Um, in Our Time, 1925, has two endings, which I alluded to very briefly last time. The last story, Big Two-Hearted River Part Two, ends with Nick Adams having set up camp. And with this sentence, there were plenty of days coming when he could fish in the swamp. So the novel proper, the last of the pieces of fiction, ends with there were plenty of days coming when he could fish in the swamp. So all the markers of Hemingway, fishing as a natural, physical, productive activity, plenty of days and abundance, days coming, hopefulness for the future, and the swamp, which we know from, I hope, the way I spoke about the story, is a place of life, of restorative activity, of healing, it is a positive image. But then, there's the final interchapter, those italicized chapters, this one called L'Envoi, the French word for sending, uh, which very briefly describes the narrator having a whiskey with the Greek king who had been working in the garden. And that's a quote, working in the garden. And the word garden appears again early in that short section. And the queen is seen clipping a rose bush. Such a scene, which is the final one of the novel, with the two or three of them sitting at, quote, a table under a big tree. So not a swamp, not a camp, but a table under a big tree. Drinking, quote, good whiskey is about as far removed from Nick Adams' swamp as one could imagine. And that's the point. Indeed, the reference to the king and queen tending their garden has a decidedly fairy tale quality to it. Here are the first line of that L'Envoi, which is an old fashioned and formal literary device marking the sending of a poem. So very not modern, a L'Envoi. The first line is, the king was working in the garden. It sounds like a fairy tale. And that section ends with, like all Greeks, he wanted to go to America. 
Now, we have to assume that the narrator, if it's not somebody like Hemingway or Hemingway, is the kind of person who at the end of the war could have a drink of whiskey with the king and queen of Greece. So not just anybody. And why does it end that way? With like all Greeks, he wanted to go to America because America is presented in this postscript as another kind of garden that is not a swamp, not a wilderness, but a carefully, carefully curated, cultivated, the queen is clipping roses, perhaps a kind of garden of Eden before the fall. That is a version of the American dream. But Hemingway, like Nick, is on the side of the swamp. And so he creates a tension at the end of the novel between the fiction that he's writing that is narrative and is a celebration of that swampiness and the artificial, formal, old-fashioned l'envoi, which self-consciously steps back from the novel and presents an idea of a fairy tale king and queen going to America in uh, hopes of the American dream. So there's a double ending to The Sound of the Fury as well. Part four, that is the actual narrative, like the end of Big Charted River, part two, ends with Luster swinging the carriage that's carrying Benji and drawn by the horse Queenie to the wrong side, the left side of the monument resulting in Benji's unthinking and anguished bellowing, mounting to an unbelievable crescendo. Surely one example of the word sound of the title. Until Jason, providing the fury of the title, leaps into the carriage, hurls luster aside, slashes Queenie repeatedly with the reins, cutting her again and again, strikes Luster, a teenage boy, over the head with his fist, strikes Benji and breaks his flower, telling him twice to shut up, and then threatens, threatens Luster, if you ever cross that gate with him again, I'll kill you. And thereby, a trivial false order is restored. The last phrases of the novel proper are cornice and facade, flowed smoothly once more from left to right, post and tree, window and doorway and signboard, each in its ordered place. Harmony, no sound, no fury, no life. It's a false facade. It's the order of an idiot. And I, I, I'm using that phrase in catching the reference to Macbeth, a tale told by an idiot. I'm not uh, maligning people with reduced um, mental capacities. Contrast that with the quiet composure at the end of the appendix, which presents in the true conclusion of the novel, that is the last thing we see, these others who were not Compsons, they were black. And it's, uh, those are Dilsey's family, her son TP, her daughter Franny, who provided a home for her mother with her in Memphis, grandson Luster, and of course, Dilsey herself. And the last two words of the novel, not about the various Compsons and Bascoms, not about siblings and parents and incest and guilt and suicide and impairment. The last two words are, they endured. That's not a false facade. That's not the absence of sound and fury, that's life. And of course, the irony of the book is that these are the people who were slaves and are still living in 1920s in a deeply racist society with a fantastically dysfunctional family and yet still able to endure. And in fact, uh, Luster, who's all of 14, is praised at the end for actually being able to take care of Benji, to entertain him. Uh, almost all of the caregivers and incidental people uh, mock or abuse Benji at one time or another. It's unfortunate, uh, including Luster. But in general, he becomes uh, the caddy substitute by taking care of him. Uh, that's an uh, extraordinary thing 
that for all the strom, storm and drong of the novel, for all the uh, wordiness and incident, it ends with that kind of quiet amen. They endured. What a great verb. Uh, that's Faulkner at his best. I'll say one more thing before I turn it back for comments. Faulkner was very interested early in his uh, life in thinking about being an artist. He was very drawn to the beginning of silent film industry. Uh, and he went with friends often to see silent films. And he was especially struck by montage, which is that cinematic device <clears throat> more common in silent films than in dialogue film because you have to depend on it where you're shown an image of something maybe without a caption and then it's immediately followed by an image of something else and your mind or spirit or psyche makes a connection uh, between the two images. They've done tests to show that you could take a, a shot of a man having some uh, expression on his face and then cut to a hot bowl of soup, cut back to him the same picture and people see it as his being hungry or desirous of the soup. And then they take the same thing and cut to uh, an accident where a horse maybe is maimed uh, in a street and you cut back and people think he's looking disgusted or fearful. And then you cut to a woman partially clothed and you cut back to him and the same expression unchanged now looks like desire. Uh, there's a name for that effect that I've now forgotten. Maybe somebody in the group remembers, but he was fascinated by what could be done without language in one thing after another where the logic had to be uh, provided by the people looking. And there's a lot of montage in the first two sections of this book, really uh, successfully done. Uh, so it's quarter of. Michael, do you have anyone who's suggested something else? Am I, uh, I, I froze up there, Mark. Am I still there? You're here again. Yep, you're back. If you were away, okay. you're back. Okay. <laughs> All right. Someone, uh, well, actually, let me give you a specific comment that's which, rather than a general impression. Someone wrote, um, what do all the references to shadows mean? Yeah. Looking on the internet, it, it, it said that it referred to the passage of time and the Southern family's descent in social status, but I didn't quite see that. Well, uh, I don't know about the descent in status, but uh, my response would have been, uh, it's about time, um, even without checking the internet. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the beginning of Quentin's book, section two, it's 130 pages long in my edition. And we know that he is uh, trying to escape time. Again, the quote about Christ being crucified by time. There were more than 200 scene shifts in those 130 pages. And it begins when the shadow of the sash appeared on the curtains, it was between seven and eight o'clock. And then I was in time again, hearing the watch. So the shadow on the wall is a reminder of what the watch says. That puts him back into time, impressionistically, experientially. He can't avoid it. You can throw away your watch, you can't throw away the setting sun. Uh, and I do think that's an image of time. And that's enforced by the fact that the fourth section, uh, the one on Easter Sunday begins, the day dawned bleak and chill, a moving wall of gray light out of the Northeast, which instead of dissolving into moisture, seemed to disintegrate into minute and venomous particles like dust that when Dulce, Dulce opened the door of the cabin and emerged, needled laterally into her flesh, precipitating not so much a moisture as a substance partaking of the thin, not quite congealed oil. That is, we live in a world of time, whether we like it or not. 
the sun rises, the sun sets. This is in Ecclesiastes. This is in Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, I'm not being trivial. Uh, you can't get away from living in time. The title of our last book was In Our Time. We are creatures of time. Uh, it may be that there's also some reference to a shadow falling over the house, but I want to say it's so clear that their um, inflated idea of their own uh, propriety and status uh, has been degraded that I don't think he'd have to go for something as subtle as shadow. But I do think it's a way of marking time, of reminding us that you can't get away from time. Is there another Michael or? So in case he's frozen up, uh, I'll, I'll use my time to say that. Got it. Michael. So how about this one? Okay. Welcome back. I'm back again, I think. Um, so both Faulkner and Hemingway were championed by Sherwood Anderson early in their careers, although they both shamefully later ridiculed him. Do you think Anderson's specificity of locale in Winesburg, Ohio, helped Faulkner create Yoknapatofa County, or did Anderson even suggest it? Uh, I don't know. That, that may be. I, I don't know enough about their interactions to know. I suspect that uh, given Fitzgerald's background and imagination and how deeply imbued he was with Mississippi culture, he didn't need the example of Weinberg, Ohio, uh, to think about writing uh, um, many, many novels about the same fictional characters. Characters in this book show up in other books. Uh, it's possible that he was influenced by Weinberg, Ohio, but I doubt it. I want to say one reason they made fun of him is that he didn't seem to develop uh, beyond his early promise. And like many very distinctive writers, um, uh, Sherwood Anderson was very easy to parody, very easy to write a kind of story like one of the stories in Weinberg, Ohio. It's very easy to parody Emily Dickinson or Walt Whitman, that is people with very distinctive styles. But Emily Dickinson, although not in her lifetime, and Walt Whitman in his lifetime, were tremendously celebrated as great American artists. Sherwood Anderson, as good as he was, never reached that level. And so, uh, unfortunately, a lot of competition among uh, great writers, maybe especially among great men, uh, so that's unfortunate. I did cite when we did Weinberg, Ohio, the poignancy of Anderson saying to a friend who was complimenting him on his success, that to the contrary, you don't know the agony involved in being listed in the very first rank of the second rate writers of America. And uh, that's a sentence that was carefully crafted to make the point. So. Uh, I, I'm getting a, a message that there's an unstable internet connection. Can you still hear me, Michael? Yes, I just, I, I think that you've been fine and everybody else has been fine. I just, my, my session just crashed out and I just came back. Okay, so I have a few minutes and I'm going to use that time. I'm saying, I think Michael designed this instability to enact the instability of the novel. I think it was a brilliant uh, kind of uh, strategy on his part. So Michael has been generous enough to invite me back. We don't have the date yet, but he's agreed to the next uh, series being a five-part series on the American novel between the world wars, that is novels of the 1930s. Technically speaking, these are still modernist novels, that is novels written between the two world wars. And they are all from the 30s ending in 1940. Henry Roth, call it sleep, Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God, John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, Nathaniel West's The Day of the Locust, and Carson McCullers' The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. Um, these are truly great books, but beyond that, they show the opening up to a greater variety of the American experience from the narrowness of the great books by Fitzgerald 
and Hemingway and Anderson and Faulkner. I say narrowness because what these books give us <coughs> is urban immigrants and the Jewish American experience and rural African Americans who are the subjects of the novel, not just <coughs> a <coughs> add-on to a story about white people. They show the devastating effects of the Great Depression and its testing of the promise of the American dream, both in <clears throat> Grapes of Wrath and The Day of the Locust. They are in general more inclusively considerate of just how varied the people are in We the People. That is, the novel grows up in its understanding of the vastness of America. <clears throat> Now, in 1940, when The Hard is a Lonely Hunter is published, uh, coming on up to uh, you know, 90 years ago, it's still true that a lot of America was being ignored. And just because Henry Roth in 1934 publishes a monumentally admirable novel in Call It Sleep, a kind of Joycean uh, version of the Jewish immigrant experience on the Lower East Side, doesn't mean that Jewish themes came into American literature, but it's beginning. It took until the 1960s. It partly started on college campuses when more and more American studies departments were embracing hyphenated Americans, Native Americans, Jewish Americans, Latinx Americans, and on and on and on, certainly African Americans. It happened when Broadway opened up to plays like Fiddler on the Roof or Cabaret uh, to suggest that the Jewish American experience was very much part of the American experience. You can read many of the novels of the 20s and be disgusted by how great writers have treated uh, Jews in their fiction, which has been true for centuries. So again, uh, wider and more open, not as open as it could be. Uh, five truly great books. We're getting two women um, onto the titles uh, of authors, uh, and one of them, a terrific African-American writer, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, who was also a practicing anthropologist back in the day when no women typically did that, and least of all, Black women. So an interesting array, and I really appreciate um, Michael's not getting tired of me. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Well, um, I'm, I'm enjoying this sequence as we go along. I want to say that uh, when, when we talked about Mark's next series and then he suggested those books, I think it's going to be fantastic. I've only read Grapes of Wrath, so I'll be looking forward to reading all four of the other ones. Um, and as he pointed out, it's a really interesting and, and I think very, very uh, thought-provoking assortment of, of novels to talk about. So I'm glad we'll be able to have you back. Um, as he said, we don't have the dates, but it's most likely going to be in June, and you'll have plenty of time from me to find out, uh, you know, what the dates are and to be reminded of the exact titles if you want to read them in advance, kind of the way we usually do things around here. Um, I think um, that maybe I will technologically quit while I'm ahead um, <laughs> before, and I apologize for the disruptions, although Mark covered me very well there. Um, with our multi multimedia meta presentation. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, I just, I think it's been a great series and we're looking forward to having Mark back. And if, if anyone's interested in getting a head start, Call It Sleep by Henry Roth is the first book we're doing. It's the only very long book. And remember I've... folks, there were, uh, there were a few the only very long book of the five as I remember. And so if even though Michael will give you plenty of notice, if you want to get a head start and you've never read Call It Sleep, that's where you should start. There you go. All right, folks. Well, uh, again, thank you for attending. We've had great, uh, great attendance all five weeks. And I, I hope to see you all and others uh, in June with the next the next books in our series. And uh, enjoy, enjoy the rest of your evening, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And thanks. Thank you, Michael. And thanks again, Mark, for a great series. We'll see you again. Uh, we'll see you again soon. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Bye.